Welcome back to The Graham Stephan Show. So somebody sent me this video and told me that I should watch it and react to it here in the channel. So what I did, I previewed the first few minutes of it and immediately I realized this is a really important video to watch, to discuss, and talk about. Because it's about living on minimum wage or the unlivable wage as uh, this title suggests. So with that said, I want to talk about it uh, as soon as you hit the like button and subscribe because I think not only is this documentary incredibly well done, but it's really enlightening to see exactly what people go through and their thoughts on the situation. So with that said, thank you so much, and now let's begin. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. 100,000 to 7,000? That, by the way, I think is the result of automation. It's just flat out. These companies are getting way more efficient. Robots and AI are, are taking some of the jobs like that that is purely just manual labor. I think we'll continue to see that. I think factories pretty soon will be nothing but a few people, a few high paid people, by the way, just checking on the machines and making sure they're working correctly and people coming in and repairing as needed. More coffee. You're welcome. Everything okay? Oh, those diners are amazing. I've gone on road trips, by the way. You always stop in the most random of spots in a little town as you're driving through. Stop in a diner like this. They're all fantastic. The one thing I really like about these, not only are the prices actually really good, but the service. It's just like everyone is so friendly at those places. Go to like a Denny's in the middle of a city. You're not going to get the same sort of service like you get in a small mom and pop place like this. It's just, it's kind. It makes you feel very at home and the food is really good. I can't get over how cheap everything is here. I know. It's like these prices haven't changed in the 45 years you've been open. <laughs> You know what's so funny? He mentioned the cost of the food. That was the first thing that I was thinking when I think of places like this. It's just the cost of the food. I remember going to a place, uh, I think this is like passing through Arizona or something like that uh, by the Grand Canyon and seeing some of these places like $5 for a hamburger. I'm like, what? It's cheaper than McDonald's and it's like way better quality. How do they do that? How do they charge $5 for this? It is unreal. And again, the quality was great. Breakfast House in Kokomo, Indiana has been around since the city's heyday as a manufacturing hub. I get the feeling this is a place where you see lots of regulars. Yes, it is. <laughs> and how long have you been here? Uh, it'll be 42 years in March. 42 years. Oh my gosh, 42 years at the same job. That is loyalty. You don't really see that nowadays. Nowadays, it's the job hoppers who are rewarded. The more you move and like move from one place to another to another, now those are the people generally making more money. But I have to say the loyalty on something like this, phenomenal. Then again, you also have to count on the employer to treat you well for those 42 years not to leave. So I think it's a bit of a balance there. Employer has to do better to retain employees and then employees have to basically, uh, I don't know, get compensated fairly for that. Uh, otherwise, they should leave. So, uh, without getting too personal, are, are tips enough to make a living off of? Yes, yeah. I, like I said, I've been doing it for 42 years. Uh -huh. <laughs> so. That's the thing, too. I'm sure over 42 years, you've had the, some of the same clients for 42 years. Hopefully, those are the people that'll tip you for just knowing somebody that long and being served for that. Like, at that point, after 42 years, you should be able to walk in and she'll know based on the time of day and your mood exactly what you want to eat and how you like your steak and like how you like your coffee. I bet there's so many nuances like this, she just has memorized. Throughout town, it's hard not to walk five feet without seeing some of the relics of the manufacturing industry that really drove the economy, not only of this town, but of, of this country. And it's all kind of relegated to the past. What do they do with that though? Here's the thing, it's like, you know, Detroit was once a major hub, major. And people ended up moving away and, uh, you know, now houses are selling for a dollar there. And all the jobs moved to San Francisco. You know what, I, I mean, it would be amazing if one day San Francisco, Los Angeles, Miami, like, People aren't living there anymore. I mean, most likely they will just because of, you know, climate conditions. But it goes to show you, anywhere in the U.S., it's going to change over time. The same businesses today that are dominating are not going to dominate for the next 100 years. Most likely. I mean, hey, I could be wrong, but when you look at the S&P 500 from 1970 through today, the top companies are a lot different in 1970 than they are today. And they were a lot different 30 years before that. So, like, when you go back in the top businesses by every decade, they change over time. Very rarely is a company able to stay on top for more than a few decades. We went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. 
thousand. And it's effectively been replaced by shopping centers and restaurants. Shopping centers, service industries, small factories. It's not really an equal exchange, is it? Yeah, see the issue is that, you know, if people are stuck or isolated to one location and they can't move, then, you know, then they're reliant on basically whatever the economy is going to provide. At that point, I think it's no wonder why a lot of people begin moving out. But if you stay, it's just like, where are the job opportunities? That's why a lot of people end up moving somewhere else, because perhaps there are better economic conditions there. And this is, to me, a sign that the economic conditions aren't the best. The wages there are reflective of that. And if people don't leave, which I get easier said than done. Oh, just leave. I get that people don't have the uh, resources to be able to do that. But you know what? Otherwise, what's the alternative? Is is really this. The federal minimum wage in the U.S. is $7.25 an hour. But there's an exception for employees that earn tips called the tipped minimum wage that allows restaurants to pay as little as $2.13 per hour in 15 states. Now, my understanding for that of paying servers less, and again, I could be totally wrong here, but my understanding is that the restaurant industry is it has such thin profit margins. Oftentimes it could be like three to sometimes 10% profit net at the end of the day after, after paying everything out. And so part of the way that they would be able to stay in business is by paying the servers less and relying on tips. I don't know if that's 100% the case, but that's my understanding is that if the restaurant had to pay them more, the restaurant themselves would be going out of business or have to charge more on their food to the point where they end up losing an equivalent amount of business. Again, that's just my understanding. I could be wrong. Uh, if, if I am wrong, please, please correct me in the comment section. How much would you say you're walking out with each night? This week, I walked out with like $20 one night and $35 the next night. And then like on the weekend, I made like 75. Yikes. I mean, at that, it's like, is that even worth it? $35 in a day. Now, most likely she's working six to eight hour shifts. How is that, how is that worth it? It would be, it would be hard to stay employed uh, or have the motivation to keep doing that if that's what the pay is. And you know, I know it's easier said than done than say, oh, you know, leave and find another, another job because you know, sh she has to make that minimum wage. But part of me wonders is like, if, if unemployment will cover that, if unemployment might be more than what she's making right now. Even if people are tipping the 20% that is standard for great service, most servers are tipping out three to 5% of that to bussers, hosts, and bartenders. What if I leave you nothing? What happens? then we have to pay that tip out whether you give us money or not. What? That seems like that should be illegal. Like, the, tack it onto the bill then. Why put that, that responsibility should not be on the server. If she's responsible for paying out minimum 3% on every order, charge it on the bill. Why should that come out of her pocket to pay the busters, the bartender? That upsets me. That should be on the owner or just on people like, hey, if we don't get a tip, none of us give a tip. That should not be coming out of her pocket. So, so like say your bill is $100 and yeah. I have to tip out 5% and you don't tip me at all, I'm paying $5 to wait on you. Does that happen? I would say it probably happens at least once a shift. Come on, I, again, I don't get how that's legal. That to me seems like some shady stuff there. I, I don't think there's a law that requires that. I would be shocked. Maybe I'm wrong, okay? But that to me is ridiculous. Ridiculous. One in 11 American workers currently works in restaurants. One in two Americans has worked in the industry at some point in their lifetime, and yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. You know why? I think it's because it's just, uh, how easy is it to replace you? That's really what it comes down to. Restaurants will pay an equivalent amount of how difficult it would be to get someone else in there to do your exact same job. If that were something that would be highly skilled, generally it would pay more. If there were a lot of people looking for work, you know, the pay is less because more people want the job. A lot of times I, I tend to believe the pay is, is a reflection on simply that. It's just supply and demand, like almost any other industry. When the idea came to the States, the restaurant lobby demanded the right to hire newly freed slaves, mostly black women, not pay them anything and have them live entirely on this new idea that had just come from Europe called a tip. That's very interesting. See, I'm learning a lot 
from going through this. That's a point I had no idea exists. And it's also interesting that in Europe, it's like, you know, we were in Croatia. It's like, you don't, you don't tip there. It's so odd. When you get the bill, there's nothing there for tips. It's just the bill is the bill. And tipping is just not a thing. It, it's odd how this is very much like a United States, uh, Canada sort of thing. I mean, those are the only two places I've, I've been otherwise that have tips. But it's interesting that this is very much to the US, but other countries don't have this. You can work your butt off and give them the best service they could have ever hoped for that night. And if they feel like only giving you a $5 tip on a $50 bill, then that's all they're gonna give you. You can't go back to them and be like, I deserve more. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, it's really, if it's optional and up to the person who's tipping to pay, you're gonna get some bad tippers. That's just the reality of it. Part of me thinks though, shouldn't there be like a minimum payout at the end of the at the end of the week or something like that, where it's like, okay, you know what? We'll pay you the base of two dollars and thirteen cents an hour. But if you make in total, including tips, less than five hundred dollars in the week, we'll make up the difference. So that that way, you get no matter what, even if you get zero tips or like a million dollars in tips, you'll you'll make at least the minimum, the 500 bucks. Like they, they should have something like that. Where that way people aren't making less than minimum wage on tips. Maybe we're going hungry this month. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're eating less. It, like, is that is that something you have to think about? Mm -hmm. So food is like the last thing that you're expensive The last for. thing I think of because it's whatever we have left will go towards it. That includes going to food banks. See, I wonder if there's any remote teleworking jobs out there that she would be able to do from home that pay more than $7.50 an hour. Now, I've seen just anecdotally, go online, you see a lot of remote like call center jobs paying $12, $13 an hour that are based here in the United States, or sales jobs that could pay way more than that if she uh, hones her phone skills, if she's good with customer service and might be able to upsell on a product or call warm leads. She could potentially be making like $30, $40 an hour if she's able to close deals like that on the phone. So I think you know, it might be worth looking at other opportunities at that point, especially work from home because she's got kids. We still already spend over $100 every week, and that's going to food banks. Like with two kids, a husband that works, me. No, I gotta say, they are really on track on this. $100 a week for a family of four for eating every night? What does that come out to be? That's actually just over, what, $13 a day for four people. After I paid my babysitter on Wednesday, I made $10. After I paid her on Thursday, I made $20. Friday, I think I made 60. Saturday, I made about 70. And then Sunday, I made 70. It's interesting. It seems like during the week, there's no point to her working. When she's really counting the cost of gas, wear and tear on her car, extra insurance, uh, the cost of time, it's like she's really walking away with maybe like $10 in profit, maybe $15 in profit, Monday through Thursday. At that point, I feel like, what's the point of, of working at that? Like, there's gotta be something else. There's gotta be something else that'll pay more than what you would make otherwise going in Monday through Thursday at the restaurant job. There's, there's gotta be. We've seen seven states move away from this system. Now, if you listen to the National Restaurant Association, you might think those seven states have no restaurants. On the contrary, these seven states actually have higher restaurant industry sales per capita. But how much of that though is that they're the ones that could afford to pay higher prices because people in those states make a lot more money and therefore are able to spend a lot more money. Like I have a feeling if that one restaurant that we saw with $3.99 steaks and stuff like that, if they were forced to pay more, I wonder if that place would be in business or not. I think a place in California could probably afford it just because they're denser. But again, maybe that's just, I'm trying to think outside the box. I'm trying to find a way where maybe there's some reasoning there, or maybe there's not, okay? There's, there's a chance the companies are just greedy. But I'm trying to think, okay, is there, is there something else here that we are missing? Maybe, I don't know. It really is terrible that you have to rely on other people essentially to for your livelihood your bills, your, the clothes on your children's back, like, that's, it's crazy. A lot of things that are always, no matter what you do, are outside of your control. Like even me as a real estate agent, like my entire reliance was on the clients of whether or not they decide to work with me. And in a way, like I'd make zero dollars unless I got a sale or, you know, got a client, a referral, did a lease, you know, some sort like that. You're always relying on somebody else. 
but you know, instead you should really focus on just what is in your control right now today. And that is where you spend your time, uh, if there's something you could do to move upwards, maybe uh, some other opportunity that's out there, uh, because otherwise the alternative is, is just sticking with it. And if you're unhappy with it, you know, I, I get, again, easier said than done, but if there's anything that's in your control, it's how you spend your time and, and what you're doing with that time. And I just refuse to believe that there can't be upward mobility somewhere for the people who really want to change their lives. And, and that's always what I like to believe because otherwise you're just at the whims of you know whatever your boss says. I like to believe that there is something more than that. So that's just been my experience. Yeah, see, this is what I thought. If they do not earn at least the minimum wage from wage plus tips in a given shift, an employer owes that worker the full minimum wage. That's what I thought. So there's no way that they should be making less than that minimum wage. Like that one lady who's working all day and making like 30 bucks, that employer is doing something illegal. And if that's the case, maybe it's worth reporting the employer and you know, maybe going after them for wages because chances are, not just you, it's the entire industry that you're working in that is breaking the law. Like at least I think uh, compliance with the law is extremely important. Hey, thanks for checking out CBSN Originals on YouTube. So let me know what you guys think down below in the comments section. Thank you so much for sending this to me. If there are any other videos you want me to watch and uh, comment on, please let me know. Just title the video down below in the comments section. As always, make sure to subscribe, hit the like button, and also, if you guys want some free stocks that's worth potentially all the way up to a few thousand dollars when you make a deposit, I've got a paid affiliate link down below in the description. When you sign up. Again, it could be worth all the way up to a few thousand dollars for like five minutes worth of work. So let me know what you think. Let me know what stocks you get. Thank you so much for watching and until next time.